came to fruition in 1985 in the Le Oregon legislature. And you know, this is passing at a time of increased neoliberal pressure and Reagan era uh, privatization. Reagan, ooh, boo. <laughs> Uh, APP's next step was to enshrine the proposed downtown economic improvement district uh, into city code. And then, um, yeah, by the time Clean and Safe piloted it in 1989 and into the 90s, the APP had grown into a major political player. Um, however, with Reagan's presidency came extensive cuts to federal programs that funded urban centers. So the issue of poverty and crime persisted. And downtown, sorry, businesses and residents were getting frustrated that the APP didn't really solve anything and that downtown was still economically struggling. So the APP studied and they created a proposal for economic improvement district to serve downtown with, again, increased security and cleaning. So in 1987, they set up this downtown economic improvement committee to, to discuss implementing the um, EID, the uh, economic improvement district. And then they, the city council approved the EID on um, June 1st, 1988, on the condition that um, you know, they develop this final economic improvement plan. And Clean and Safe is one of Portland's three enhanced service districts. Um, and their versions, they're Portland's version basically of, of what are com commonly known as business improvement districts um, in other cities. So these uh, districts naturally rose when a time, and then during a time when uh, public housing was being defunded and the prison industrial complex was expanding greatly. So BIDs were used to manage um, the homeless caused by, uh, homelessness caused by people losing their, their houses through carceral means. And uh, next slide, please. You know, you know the saying like everything, everything bad starts with Reagan. I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say everything bad starts with Nixon, but also Reagan just elevated everything to a whole another shitty level. Um, so neoliberalism, as uh, many of you probably know, with its relentless pursuit of market deregulation, privatization, and a diminished role for the state, found a zealous champion in old Ronald Reagan. And under the guise of neoliberalism, Ronald Reagan's presidency marked an era of deep-seated racism and a pal palpable disdain for the poor, cloaked in the rhetoric of free market and uh, self-reliance. And under his presidency, this ideology materialized through extensive cuts to federal programs that were already struggling. Um, and his administration's ruthless cuts were not just like a policy shift, but in my opinion, it was a manifestation of a broader contempt for those trapped in poverty and especially the racially marginalized, com marginalized communities that are disproportionately affected by these decisions. So um, Reagan's approach to governance, um, characterized by a significant rollback of support for the most vulnerable, was not just economically devastating, but also morally rehens reprehensible, in my opinion. So it was really just an ideology infused with racism, punishing the poor for their circumstances while dismantling the very structures um, needed to aid them. And his policies did not just neglect the urban poor, they actively worsened their plight, deepening the fissures of inequality and injustice in American society. So Ronald Reagan's legacy is the testament to the cruelty of a political philosophy that prioritizes the market over people, leaving behind a scarred urban landscape and countless lives caught in the crossfire of an ideological battlefield. And so, next please. With that said, um, you know, I mentioned city council passed an ordinance establishing um, economic improvement districts in 1988, which paved the way for what would become uh, Clean and Safe. So Clean and Safe receives millions annually through economic uh, service district ESDs, property management uh, license fees that they collect, the city collects. And um, the majority of these funds go to private security and of course, extra Portland police officers again um, who are also managed by this private security company, and they also had contracts with the district attorney's office. So um, in 1990, the APP implemented an anti-panhandling campaign called Real Change, Not Spare Change. And meanwhile, they coordinated with the police bureau to implement strict guidelines preventing many street musicians from playing, which I'm like, really? Like, you're against, like, busking? Like, come on. That's, I feel like it's something that Portland was sort of known for, but they didn't like it, so, you know, they tried to get rid of it. And then in 1991, there's uh, Measure 5 approved, which basically made that, um, that fee that they got from the parking garages unconstitutional. 
And so they switched to a format where it's like they didn't force people to pay. Basically, businesses got to choose whether they wanted to pay or not. But most egregiously, the APP lobbied, successfully lobbied for a drug and prostitution free zone in Old Town in 1992. And this allowed police and security to issue exclusions to people arrested on multiple drug charges. And most of these people were black, of course. And this ordinance was in place until 2007. So it was there for a while. And um, in 1993, uh, Clean and Safe partnered with the downtown district attorney, um, which provided prosecution services focused on low priority survival crimes, such as panhandling, trespassing, et cetera. And the BID allowed Clean and Safe to, uh, Business Improvement District, allowed Clean and Safe to fund half of their program while Multnomah County just f uh, funded the rest. And uh, the projected cost for one year of services under the BID was $1.8 million, with over a million dollars going to the security program, you know, so basically police. And in 1993, uh, one year before the EID contract expired, the APP was looking for alternative funding so they can um, collect fees again. And with the help of an advisory committee, they submitted another report to the city council, and this time trying to turn clean and safe into a business improvement district. This would allow the city to begin collecting business license fees, which are now called property management license fees. Um, and so this was, this was approved in 1994, with, and with this increase of money, they expanded Clean and Safe, and they increased the amount of security, and, including armed officers who are either retired or off-duty officers, and they also established a team to harass panhandlers. And so uh, the BID was up for renewal in 1997, and this was controversial because they decided to raise the fee, and it was really unpopular, but despite the opposition, it was renewed. And then in 1998, uh, Portland Patrol Incorporated was created and began contracting with Clean and Safe to provide armed and unarmed guards. And this allowed uh, Portland Patrol to manage two police officers directly. And so um, in the 90s, the district attorney's office saw a huge increase in caseloads, mostly involving crimes of survival. And um, yeah, and then uh, the DA successfully lobbied for federal funding and established a community court um, in order to prosecute those survival crimes. And so um, Clean and Safe, the, the BID, and all of these things were um, partnering with the DA to help them focus on these crimes of survival, which don't they have something better to do? But, you know, I guess not. Um, so next. All right, so uh, next. Uh, next. Okay, the aughts, so <laughs> getting closer to now. Um, so um, the county's budget prevented the DA's office from expanding their community court program. Um, and the Portland Business Alliance at the time agreed to support the community court and began funding for a legal assistant, a courtroom clerk, and a community uh, service crew leader. So basically, like, they're helping to pay for this because they wanted so much for the DA to be prosecuting lifestyle crimes. And so basically, this crew leader would lead some um, uh, community service, and it would be people that were sentenced uh, the through the court. community courts. And began funding for a legal... Okay. <laughs> I'm like, what was that? <laughs> Echo! <laughs> this. Um... Yeah, so basically, clean and safe in order to reduce costs had these people that were prosecuted and um, convicted of these lifestyle crimes and they got free labor, much like how our prison industrial complex you know, gets free labor from prisoners all over the country. So basically, they saved almost a million dollars worth of wage costs through this arrangement with the DA. And then we have in 2000, Kim Kimbrough became the new executive director of APP, which that name sounds fake, but it's real. <laughs> and um, let me just say, like, he's originally from the South. He went to, like, Ole Miss, all these other things. He lived in Portland for, like, a year before he started working here. And um, he was kind of a shitty person. <laughs> Not kind of, very much. So Willamette Week had this interesting article back then that talked about one of Kimbrough's, Kimbrough's first moves upon coming to Portland from New Orleans in 2001 
was a smart but telling re re renovation. The door to his 10th floor office in the Pioneer Building contained a large glass panel. He immediately ordered it replaced with a sod solid wooden door with a secure lock. And he informed his employees that his door was always open with a secure lock, um, as long as they made an appointment in advance. And then shortly after, he fired nearly half of them. <laughs> Um, so his public behavior was also like very unusual. So he was the, the CEO of Portland Business Alliance at the time, and he was supposed to be marketing the city um, to the rest of the world. But he spent most of his time talking about how terrible a place Portland is, which also sounds familiar because they're still doing that today. And uh, yeah, it made people really angry because yeah, he's supposed to be marketing Portland, but he's not. Um, so while he was in charge, he proposed that the APP merge with the Regional Chamber of Commerce as a means to strengthen their political advocacy. And this new entity is what um, formed the Portland Business Alliance. And then, yeah, in 2001, the city decided to renew that district, um, but they were able to successfully negotiate a 10-year um, a contract because the, review, because the re reviewing every four years was too expensive. And yeah, next. Um, so PBA is born, as I mentioned, and um, yeah, let's go next. Oh, and by the way, that was a Rosemary's Baby um, reference. I don't know if people got it because the child, you know, PBA was the satanic child of the APP and the, the unholy alliance between the two. Anyways, that was, I don't know if people would get it. Yeah, and then we have the Occupy era, which they were actively, um, you know, getting people arrested. Um, you know, they were doing all this terrible stuff. They were also opposing Rights to Dream 2 in 2012. They were opposing the teachers union. And they, they tried to pass a sit-lie law, which basically, you know, tries to get people from not sitting and lying in the street, you know, and, and a lot of that was due directly to the Occupy movement. And I will pass it over. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we're gonna kind of shift into the present time. Um, so in the first half of the 2010s, the current mayor of Portland was Charlie Hale, um, who was very unpopular with the PBA, likely because of, I mean, boo, boo all mayors. Um, he, he, ha he had a safe sleep policy, which was basically an encouragement of not enforcing the uh, camping bans, um, and the PBA very much did not like that. Um, so moving on to 2016, even though it wasn't that long ago, I think it's important to remember the historical context of that time. There was a really big uptick in political activity and direct response to the election of Donald Trump. There was both an increase in um, alt-right, um, far-right reactionary mobilizations, but there was also a really large surge of mass movements, particularly around the issues of wealth inequality, um, police violence, especially against the black community, and um, like movements against fossil fuel infrastructure. So by the 2016 election, the PBA had found an ally in Ted Wheeler who ran on the platform of building a government that worked for every person, quote. Um, but behind the scenes, he held a confidential meeting with the PBA um, right before the launch of his campaign in October 2015. Next slide, please. Because of the visibility of camping. In 2018, Ted Wheeler called for an increase in police fund funding, and this was shortly after, apologies if I say his name incorrectly, John Elifritz, an individual who was suffering severe mental illness was shot, fatally shot by Portland police. And later that same year, he attempted to pass an ordinance to restrict or ban protesting, and this was clearly in response to the anti-fascist activity against um, Patriot Prayer, which was an alt-right group that was terrorized, literally terrorizing people downtown. Finally, um, we can look at uh, Ted Wheeler's Central City uh, Recovery Plan, which was unveiled earlier this year. And this seeks to do everything that the PBA has called for in the past decades, which includes increasing the number of police downtown, facilitating, uh, camping sweep, facilitating the sweep of camping sites, and trying to put houseless people in sanctioned campsites, supporting the clean and safe um, district, as well as the development of ESDs, and mandating city employees to return to offices in spite of the fact that there's still an ongoing pandemic. Next slide, please. So we're gonna kind of go over these next slides really fast. It's a lot of ground to cover, um, but uh, we do have, some of our panelists have worked on these campaigns, so you'll hear a little bit about it. So um, these are just some policies that the PBA has supported or gone against um, with regards to poverty and, and economic inequality. It goes without saying that the PBA has put a lot of effort into trying to prevent taxes from being raised. 
And we're gonna talk more about that, so I won't really um, say much more about it. Um, next slide, please. So with regard to climate change, um, the PBA has opposed um, Better NATO, which is a really big um, and highly utilized bike lane. They have, also, um, they have also opposed the Portland Clean Energy Initiative, which funds environmentally friendly public projects using a business license surcharge. In 2017, the PBA attempted to block a policy which would prevent Portland from building a new fossil fuel infrastructure. This was a propane export terminal in North Portland for Pembina Pipeline Corp. And this is a company from Calgary that, ex that transports fossil fuels. The PBA also supported Pembina's other project, the Jordan Cove Liquefied Gas Ch Terminal in Coos Bay. This project was ultimately canceled in 2021, but it would have been environmentally disastrous, especially because it was a natural gas terminal built on a subduction zone, which is so stupid. Like, just unbelievably, like, why would anyone do that? Um, next slide, please. So regarding crime and policing, um, the PBA loves funding the police. As of right now, the, P the Portland Police Department claims about 30% of the city's general funds in the budget, and the PBA has consistently supported all efforts to increase police funding. This is in spite of the fact that there was a huge call for defunding the police in 2020 by the masses. The police budget is actually higher right now than it's ever been before. Portland Street Response also emerged from this call to reallocate emergency calls to a non-police service. And a survey done by Portland State University has shown that Portland Street Response has actually accomplished its goals in um, reducing the number of calls going to police, as well as reducing the number of ER visits. Renee Gonzalez, a well-known PBA pro, also have heavily been demonized by the PBA. This is the decriminalized drug, can, um, decriminalized drug uh, ballot measure. Um, and this is even though there's been an almost 300% increase in people seeking um, uh, addiction treatment in the state of Oregon, our overdose rates are lower than our neighboring states, and crime has actually dropped 14% in the state of Oregon. And then finally, the PBA has made a strong push to get the city to invest in surveillance technologies like gunshot detection technology. Well, and they have also in the past opposed Portland's facial recognition ban. Um, next slide, please. So how does the PBA do all of this? And I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. It's just gonna be kind of an overwhelming amount of information, but I just wanna illustrate how they um, essentially consolidate their power and influence their, um, get the, like basically influence the uh, public opinion. So they do this by super PACs. And a PAC and a super PAC are basically political groups that raise and spend money on elections, but are not officially or directly run by political parties or individual candidates. So I'm gonna show you just like a small sampling of what this looks like. And I wanna be clear, this is a very, very tiny sampling that shows a very limited situation. And following the flow of funds from businesses and individuals to campaigns and candidates gets very confusing. This is entirely by design. PACs will often donate to other PACs, which then donate to even more PACs. And some PACs don't even seem to be directly supporting any campaigns, but instead, instead fund services like printing services, marketing services, or consulting services. Um, next slide. So this is the Portland Alliance PAC, and these are a few individuals that are um, funding it. I'll just read this really quickly. There's two PACs, Alliance PAC and Natural Gas Political Action Committee. And then there's also the Trailblazers, Alice Powell, Amazon, Nike, Intel, and Pacific Corp. Next slide. So these two PACs are funded by power, basically energy companies, Pacific Power and Northwest Natural Gas Company. Next slide. The Natural Gas Political Action Committee also funds another PAC, Oregon Business and Industry Candidate PAC. Next slide. The Portland Alliance PAC funds another PAC, Building Our Future Together. Next pack slide. That PAC is funded by these individuals, National Association of Realtors, Portland Metro Association of Realtors, Portland Business Alliance, the Standard Schnitzer Investment Corp, and another PAC, can you believe it? Oregon Business and Industry Issues PAC. Next slide. This PAC is funded by these very familiar names. I've already read them before because they're funding other things here. North Northwest Natural Gas Company, Pacific Corp, Nike, and The Standard. Next slide. So these three um, PACs, they fund this Stop the Metro Tax, and this was a, um, this was a campaign to vote no for Measure 26218, which was a payroll tax um, measure. Next slide. Um, and then all of these entities here, they, through the Building Our Future Together PAC, they were funding the campaign to oppose the capital gains tax and eviction legal defense 
measure. This is measure 26238. Um, so this shows in essence what the Portland Business Alliance and all of the large business interests in Portland do to consolidate their power and influence public opinion and wage ca counter campaigns against our movements. Um, yeah, next slide. So yeah, the power brokers behind the PBA are always going to relentlessly oppose our campaign and movements to consolidate their power and also protect their bottom line. So we need to stand united against them. Yeah, great. Next, next slide. Okay, we're gonna do a community panel um, where we're gonna get more into this and it's gonna be great. Thanks for um, walking us. Thanks for being with us as we walk through that. I know it's extremely complicated, but we just wanted to have a quick rundown of like the history of, of um, these business interests and how they've been opposing good work for a long time, and it's like a cycle, same thing over and over again. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. What? Sorry. Oh, so if you want the slides, if you signed in, um, we will send that out. So. Make sure you, you know, sign in if you haven't yet. Um, yes, sign in with one. Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. So rather than me giving an introduction, um, I figure I'll let you all introduce yourself. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and give us a snapshot of the campaign you worked on? Sure. We we good for us. <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary King. I'm an economist retired from the PSU faculty and a member of the Portland DSA. I'm here to talk about our successful grassroots people-powered coalition campaign for Universal Preschool Now. Yes. Woo! Yes, 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 yes. And if you're not familiar, this is a two-generation anti-poverty program and done right, it reduces racial disparities, gender disparities, and class disparities. And what is rolling out right now in this county is free, year-round, full-time preschool for all three and four-year-olds, lots of choices for families, including language, size of setting, cultural approach, building wages for the labor force to get at least comparable to kindergarten teachers, which may not sound like a lot, but it's double what people are getting now union neutrality, funded by an income tax on the top 5%, and getting to full universality by fall 2030. Yes. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Armini. I'm the Systemic Change Program Director at Sisters of the Road, but I am just a single representative of all of the organizers that worked on the end ESD's campaign, which is ongoing, but um, You'll know more about it shortly. Yeah, we'll talk more about those economic improvement districts. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Cody Urban, uh, along with Sarah, who was one of our great uh, presenters earlier. I'm an organizer with the International League of People Struggle, which is an alliance of over 300 organizations around 45 different countries. Around 60-ish of those are here in the US. A solid handful of those are here in Portland. And so the campaign that we th threw all of our weight behind uh, in our US chapter last year, including our orgs here in Portland, uh, was kind of like the Portland Business Alliance, but on a much bigger scale. We had a campaign against the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Alliance, which is APEC which if you heard of the World Trade Organization or WTO, it's kind of like a smaller version of that that just focuses around the countries of the Pacific Rim, which is over 60% of the global economy. Basically, it is a new world the environment, women, uh, lots of other people, uh, just to, for, to make profit, to be able to plunder more from other countries. And so we actually led a campaign against the ministerial meetings up in Seattle that happened last uh, August and against the uh, heads of state meeting where they had the presidents and prime ministers and even some monarchs of these countries all came to wine and dine and change these laws with big cor 
corporate owners like Jeff Bezos. But really what we see is that in our experience in rallying the people against APEC at the international scale, what we see in the Portland Business Alliance is the exact same thing, this dark cabal of uh, business owners that are changing laws uh, that go in their favor and make life uh, worse for all of us. Well, I'm Rebecca Markley. I use she, her pronouns um, with the Portland DSA, and I'm here to talk about the eviction representation for all campaign, which you heard a little bit about earlier, but it was um, a campaign that we worked on to bring legal representation to every single tenant in eviction court, funded with a 0.75% increase in capital gains taxes. Great. This stood in the way of your campaign's goals, and how did they attempt to block your block the campaign's progress? Speaking for up now, the Portland Business Alliance opposed us, and they're still opposing us. Corporations, and who are going to who are paying the income tax as individuals that funds the program. They legally challenged our ballot measure, institutional challenge, which you have to be done separately and one after the other, so it takes forever. And that was the had only five weeks to gather signatures. We gathered 32,000 signatures. Wow. I thought we were dead. COVID had hit. You know, everything was shut down. I thought the campaign was over. But we were probably saved because of poor, and they were hungry for positive change. Qualifying for the ballot, gave us the leverage to merge campaigns with our core program intact, with the less ambitious preschool pro campaign being led by the county chair, Jessica Vega-Peterson, and Social Venture Partners. I mean, really, they would have gone for the same program we were, but they were afraid to tax for it. But later, when the campaign, when that campaign learned that the Portland Business Alliance was likely to oppose our joint ballot measure in November, if there'd be a big tax break for so-called pass-through businesses. The county enacted that, luckily, kind of, during the pandemic years, you know, which during a mil, which a million people died and a lot were thrown out of work, well, they were really profitable at the top. So the tax revenues were very high, much higher than ex as we might have been. But this program needs big investments in capacity, workforce, facilities, and a really big reserve fund because it's a very unpredictable and variable tax and we have to be ready to stay stable whatever comes. But the Portland Business Alliance and especially their downtown building owner as if it weren't poverty in the streets and people seizing the chance to county to wait on the full phase in of the preschool tax which was approved two to one for, by the voters to go into effect first thing January 26. The county commissioners will almost certainly pause the full phasing of the tax for 12 months. They're gonna take action on that probably this coming month. We'll need everybody's support over the coming year to make sure that that's only a one year pause, nothing more, because if you look out at what the Revitalized Portland Coalition it wants, which is like a subset of the Portland Business Alliance, they want to do this program on the cheap. It will not work. It cannot be done right on the cheap. So we'll have to start right now. The county board is going to be decided in elections this May. We have to be working against a right-wing takeover because our friends are working for exactly that. Thank you. I almost feel like this is uh, a little difficult to answer. <laughs> Because the NDSD's campaign was essentially attacking the slush fund that Portland Metro Chamber, Portland Business Alliance, um, uses to fund their lobbying activities. So I know Jay went over Enhanced Services Districts, but just to, you know, circle back, because it's a lot to try to understand, Enhanced Services Districts, as they're now called ESDs, are at their scale, they're called like Place Management Initiatives. Um, so in Portland, ESDs, so they provide enhanced trash pickup, enhanced security, and other things like the, uh, the downtown Christmas tree lighting and the lighting of the trees all over downtown. That's a part of the 
enhanced services district. In fact, it has its own little special category that you pay into as a property owner. Um, we learned this firsthand. Sisters of the Road just bought a new building. Yay! Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> we need the, the hood spot. Um, and we received our first bill from uh, insult to injury because they are directly lobbying against, as you heard, a lot of the um, humanitarian uh, initiatives that we support <laughs> and campaign on and advocate for. So the NDSD's campaign started, oh gosh, so many years ago, 2018, 2017, a long time ago. Um, and it was, it, it formed, <sighs> In response to the Central East Side Industrial District, the, the city, the newest one, the newest little evil demon baby from the from the city, uh, located. Are we in it? I think we're just outside of it. It's from the river to like 10 or 11. What? We're in it. It's so hard to know sometimes. So as that was being formed, a lot of people came forward to advocate against the practices that we were seeing in Clean and Safe. Um, and long story short, uh, the uh, Central East Side Industrial District was is known as like the most progressive, <laughs> or was known as the most progressive of all the ESDs. Um, it, so despite pushback, there were a lot of concessions that were made for um, the security type presence. And I believe they had to allow two people with lived experience of being unhoused on their borders in these campaigns, you got to keep your eye on them. Um, the latest one, oh gosh. So the same people that worked on the Central East Side campaign also uh, sent information to the auditor, the city auditor, if you know. Uh, they are an impartial body in the city government to evaluate city programs. Um, and just based on information gathered through public records requests as, as residents of Portland, the auditor launched a um, evaluation of the ESD program in the city. And it was a very scathing audit. <laughs> and a part of the audit process means that the city has to respond to the audit. The audit made recommendations and the city had to go through a response process. So, the, big, the most recent part of our catechation of ESDs, but then two, making ESDs so annoying and um, not a great funding source <laughs> that they then become less desirable to hold by the PBA. Um, anyway, in short, <laughs> business centers did not like that idea. Um, leading contributors for, to Portland Metro Chamber as of now are like Bank of Emma businesses. So when we're talking about a Chamber of Commerce, this isn't for your mom and pop shops who like they cannot afford to have a huge voice in this organization. So um, their message was we need to have safety and order in the streets as you're seeing from the Multnomah County District Attorney, one of the candidates, <laughs> actually both of them to some extent. Um, and Oh, sorry, it's just so heartbreaking. That um, was completed two months ago. He took a lot of time to meet with individuals who were really concerned about ESDs. Um, his contract wasn't renewed, so, and also wait another year for them to bring on a new contractor who actually are called BDS planning are, and are um, consulted to make more, like, respond to this audit had a stake in maintaining these ESDs. Um, so those recommendations were made. You can read them online. Uh, the fight is still ongoing. And they don't want you to mess with their money. <laughs> they mess the short of it. So we should probably mess with their money. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of our campaign against APEC, when you're up against an institution like APEC or like the PBA, it's not just, you know, big business is not powerful on its own. It's powerful on its own because it has the state behind it. And I think that's what was so 
uh, wild about the, this, the power map, this dark web of money about how money flows to the, you know, quote unquote, right people who are going to do that bidding of the state. With PBA, that's local politics. With APEC, this is global politics that we ran into. And so, you know, for when we were down in San Francisco for the Heads of State Summit, all the Heads of State were there. <laughs> I can name them all off. Um, Biden was there. When we look at him, you know, these are some of the most ultra-militaristic heads of state that we've seen in recent years, and they're all there meeting with these big business heads. Uh, and so that translated into the relationship they have with local cities. Um, these cities spent so much money on security. I don't remember how much they spent in Seattle uh, when we had one for the ministerial meetings, but in San Francisco, uh, Mayor London Breed spent $10 million of the city's budget just to bring, to add all the police officers to be on board over time. And they also, the White House declared a special, uh, what do they call it? A special security zone, a national security zone, where they literally had a radius of about five blocks set up with uh, iron guard walls and federal police, federal forces blocking it down. Despite that, two hours, that was they called this uh, so counterterrorism special economic, uh, special security zone, is very reminiscent of right here in Portland, of another institution that I'm pretty sure the PBA has been really behind, and that's the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We have to remember that they use these terms against people who are fighting back against them. But it's also used against people who are just trying to survive, you know, counterterrorism. This is, this is what a devastating war against uh, Muslim and Arab communities. Uh, it's the same, it's the exact same rehashed so-called war on drugs or war on crime that Jay talked about that's literally just a war on black people. Um, that's what we learned is that, you know, a, mo a mass movement, um, a, a mass movement against the profit-oriented institutions like APEC, like the PBA, because we're all in this together or we all lose. And that's just what the big thing we were up at against that alliance of big business and government. Wow, I'm learning so much. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I really wanted to talk specifically about one of the ways that the PBA was so insidious in the campaign against eviction representation for all. And it was specifically about um, the messaging. And so, Bear with me, I know taxes are really boring and none of us probably pay any capital gains taxes, but capital gains taxes are the taxes that you would pay on the profit of a sale of an asset. Lots of things are considered assets like your car or your computer, but those assets typically don't appreciate in value, so you never actually pay capital gains taxes on selling your car because it starts to depreciate in value the minute you drive it off from the dealership. Um, assets that do appreciate in value are like your house or stocks or business. So interested in blocking a tax on capital gains taxes because these are, this is where rich people make most of their money because your wage is. That income is taxed differently than the income from capital gains. And so, what was unfortunate about this, um, our campaign, was that we were focusing on, the, on a message about how devastating um, evictions are for people and how they disproportionately impact like black single moms, they disproportionately impact immigrants, they disproportionately impact trans people and disabled people. Um, and obviously, so that was something that we really kind of like focused on, we wanted to have a compassionate, positive message. But we ended up losing the message, messaging game because um, the PBA was able to focus on so much of the confusion and skepticism around um, capital gains taxes that they were able to just like sow so much confusion with their deep pockets and their like incessant messaging on like every single social media platform. They paid so much money in ads, like they outspent us like seven to one dollars 
um, on everything, like on all of our ad spend. Um, and another thing that was actually also really insidious too was the way that they were able to um, co-opt very progressive language to, um, I guess, to, to push back on this like taxing the rich, this really, really grassroots movement. Um, and so they were able to partner with like local nonprofits that are by all means quite progressive in some ways, but have parts of their organizations that are actually landlords, they are community development corporations. And these boards are full of people who are deep in the real estate business, who um, work for big banks and all of that. And so the PBA was able to call up the board members of these nonprofits and say, hey, you need to get on our side because we're your board and you're ultimately, um, you know, you serve us, right? And they were actually able to ask uh, the measure 26238 was like a, was actually like the right thing. So we are trying to like take their money and like um, um, and, and fight our you know our messages, our people, our groups, and the ways that like we are still then beholden to these like neoliberal values where um, organizations are just like turning into landlords or they're like trying to foster like entrepreneurial groups and like you know creating like micro um, micro lending and like small business grants. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I feel like I learned so much as well. Labor are the same thing. So sometimes we're kind of switching back to work. Historically, we've noticed Portland Business Alliance, they just changed their name because every time anything gets bad publicity, they just change their name rather than changing what they actually do. So. Just wanted to you know, make that clear. Um, so, reflecting on this journey that you all um, were on with your campaigns, what key learnings emerged from your experience? And was there anything that you wish you'd done differently? I'm just going to focus on some really practical, locally applicable things that we learned. We learned so much in the three years that we were working on Universal Preschool now. We, it was the first electoral campaign for most of us who were sexually involved. But first, clearly, I've already told you, you need to build in a lot of time for the things they're going to throw at you. And we tried to be ready, and we weren't. Second, running a parallel campaign is a thing, a classic strategy we learned to push another proposal towards you. It worked. So that's kind of a new thing to learn about. There's something that you think should be better, but really you're on the same side. There's a way to go about that. The third thing was to reach critical mass, we realized we really focused on coalition with membership organizations, you know, unions, parties, civic organizations, the League of Women Voters, occupational associations, as well as the kind of advocacy groups that you often think of first. And the advantage of that is that then they can send messages to their members who then become volunteers too or take action to so jobs of justice, that kind of thing. I don't know, we'll just the the main thing I want to get to though is that you might win something, but it's just the beginning. The fight starts immediately to protect it, just like we're in a continuous struggle to protect the school's funding or even get it up to what it should be. We learned that right away. And you can see it now with the way the Portland Business Alliance is out to grab the money that other people have raised for specific essentials or to kill the initiatives as they're doing with Portland Street Response, tried on city charter reform, and we're trying to do for the full phasing of the preschool tax. And last though, and the hopeful thing I think, is that there are real strengths of running a volunteer people-powered campaign versus what has become the conventional consultant run, pay for everything kind of campaign that happens in politics now. You end up with a lot of people mobilized versus just a bunch of targets for mailers. And you can follow up with that group of people to push together to solidify your win. We've been working on that from the pieces of it. We're really hoping to work on that for this coming year. And stay connected for other issues in the future. So that I think is what's going to enable us to fight off the powers that be, trying to overturn the resounding electoral victory for free school for all by attacking its money. They're going to lose.
Yeah, I mean, thank you. A lot of those I would also add on cards. I think um, uh, there's so much to say around this. Um, one, uh, like, okay. One is power mapping who you're working against. Two, power mapping and the resourcing within your own group of organizers and coming up with a plan to increase that base of organizers. I think the biggest issue in many of the campaigns I've been a part of, including NDSCs, is that organizing is hard work. It takes a lot of energy and you need to build up a huge base to you know, evenly distribute that, allow people to take breaks and come back and not burn out. Burnout was such a huge, that's honestly why I'm here today. I don't think I'm the best organizer from the NDSC's campaign, but a lot of people moved on to other work and like needed to take a break from this work, and I totally understand that. Um, another is media narrative. Uh, we have, so as you can tell, diamond level and gold, platinum level people are, uh, in Portland Business Alliance are in the media. And so this story that the people who tried to get, who got this audit going, um, are actually dark money web people. That is in the uh, Portland Tribune, I believe, calling this dark money web. Um, I would love some of that dark money, by the way. Um, and then three, public education. ESVs are complicated. I feel like we were just nailing our narrative around why do ESVs matter to every single person in this room? If you are paying taxes, the property fees for ESVs are on public institutions. Your tax dollars are going into the lobbying pockets for Portland Business Alliance. Whether or not you go downtown, whether or not you're a business downtown or whether you live downtown, whatever, you're, a fraction of your taxes are going to pay those lobbying efforts. A fraction of the donations that come to Christmas Grove are going through those lobbying efforts because we can't get out of it. We are not exempt. The only people exempt are like mass shelters. Anyway, so we learned that education, events like these are necessary in order to, you know, kind of deconstruct these really complicated, like this complicated web <laughs> that's like what, 50, 60 years in the making? Um, so you all can make informed decisions and see through the, I don't know, can we curse bullshit <laughs> in a lot of our, uh, in a lot of our media sources. So media literacy, public education, base building, um, and re like mapping resources, I think are really critical. So I would totally agree with narrative. And by narrative, it also means the proper calls. What are the calls that you're calling the people to do with your campaign? So for us, that call was very simple, no to APEC. So it sounds simple, but there's actually a lot there. I mean, that we're not saying negotiate with APEC. We're not saying ask APEC for some things. We're saying we want to rally against this. We stand for everything that APEC is against. And so there's a new system that's going to be made that people have to make it. We can't ask that from these institutions. So that's a big piece of it. And building that narrative takes a lot of listening in addition to talking. You know, I, yes, we are an anti-imperialist organization. By that we mean we have a very specific uh, analysis about the connection between monopoly capitalism and political oppression and militarism overseas and right at home. But if we're just gonna say that everywhere we go and not really get into how that impacts people's lives, like talking about losing wages or um, people, peasants losing their land in countries in uh, the, Pacific, or the Pacific Rim, or about people being brutalized by funded police, um, we're not gonna reach new people. And so we actually have been able, we were able to construct very broad and encompassing narratives um, that, were, that were able to bring all these people together. There's some examples at the uh, org table if you on your way out of uh, unity statements, so also going off public education. In both uh, Seattle and San Francisco, before we had our, our mass mobilizations, like marches and our direct actions against the APEC meetings, we had a people summit both times. 
And so the declarations or the unity statements of both those people summits that came after months of online and in-person political education. So the words we were all using, we know what it meant together, and we made sure that the people in our campaigns knew that they were they were rallying against something that was directly impacting their lives. This is nothing abstract. So that's the big thing we learned to build a mass movement. It can't be abstract. It really has to speak to what people are fighting for, their bread and butter issues. Um, and we have to have a narrative that gets us all out there in the streets together. And it has to be something that people will build together and not just have to ask our rulers for. Yeah, ditto everything that has been said. And I, I wow, I feel like all my notes were going to somewhere else for me. Um, but let me, let me try to think on the spot here. Um, Kind of related to burnout and um, ensuring that you have everybody around to bring a campaign to its fruition, get it over the finish line, and then start defending it. Um, I think one regret that I had from the eviction representation for all campaign um, was how protective we were um, of the campaign. I mean, you saw this presentation, you like we, the stakes were really high. Like we were fighting a big, bad, horrible, evil thing, and so of course we were really protective, protected of it because like we didn't want it to get like sniped. We didn't want like a like shitty or worse campaign to come along and be like, oh, this is obviously like the better one for the neoliberal kind of like sensibilities. Let's go with that one, right? So we were really, really protective of that. But I think that ultimately ended up hurting us in the long run um, because we weren't able to. Um, reached this critical mass where we were able to kind of like inoculate the PBA's like deep pockets and um, media skills and media connections. Um, and the only thing that we really do have is our people power and the, the, the leverage that we create in our uh, collective action. And so I wish we had done more in this like uh, base building and I wish we had done more um, and I wish I'd been less like protective of it, even as like a, a campaign coordinator, um, because I, I wish there had been more people to like learn these essential skills to get invested and practice taking ownership of a movement that they care about. Because all of that is going to be essential, you know, when we are building towards a better future. We do fight in the long term fight against imperialism and neoliberalism. Um, but like we have to open up the doors and let people like learn, um, let people get messy, let people um, say the wrong thing and learn from those mistakes and be gracious um, and have strong community connections in order to kind of like withstand those hiccups, those moments of awkwardness, um, and still kind of come out on the other side. Well, I appreciate that. Love that. Um, so, uh, moving forward, uh, what are your next steps? Uh, presumably, you know, a lot of these folks are here because you know they might want to get involved, or you know they're they're trying to um, yeah, like get involved. So, how do you think we can galvanize a mass movement against both local and global business leaders? <laughs> What's next? I think that kind of helps with the both that was part of the last question. So I think I've said everything I wanted to say. Really great. Yeah. My How do you start a mass yeah. movement? <laughs> right. Okay. One thing we're gonna do in this town is we are not let gonna let the Portland Business Alliance and the right wing buy our city seats, our metro seats, and our county council seats, which are all up for election this year, all of them. And they are gunning for it. They are. They are raising a big buck, and we need to be talking to people right now. Cheer, cheer for that. Yes. So the ESC campaign is a little. It's it's on a on a back burner for the moment because all of the three ESCs in Portland have been renewed <laughs> for at least five years. So please educate yourselves. We have endesc.org where there's a repository of information 
Um, so if you want to learn more, I highly recommend, please learn about that. But as we said, we need to, in order to, I don't want to say combat the CBA, but yeah, undermine their efforts, we need to take multivalent approaches. So ending ESCs is just one of them. This is, it'll, if we end with human safety ESC, it'll only take away half of the salary for like their three top lobbying executives. So like, there's still a lot of other money. There's still a lot of other power players. Um, so please learn up, find an active campaign, um, and yeah, get messy. I think the most important thing to remember is that on their own, governments, whether it's local, state, federal, even all the way up to the UN, <laughs> if you can call that a government these days. Um, governments on their own do not do things to make people's lives better. We saw that whole web that is their emergency switch for when people mobilize, but that's the lesson. They don't make our lives better, we do. Any, any, um, there can be things that we can win to pressure them to do better. Like all of these campaigns that the rest of this really incredible panel here has talked about locally here. But that wasn't done because the government decided it was a good thing. It was done because of pressure. And pressure comes from power. And we build power by organizing and teaching each other and listening to each other. So regardless of what you are interested in doing, regardless if you're interested in any of the campaigns you heard today, or just even starting your own, Remember that grassroots people power is the only way that any political change is going to happen. So let's do it together. Yeah, I'm taking that energy. Thank you. Really powerful. Um, when I first started organizing, it was the beginning of the pandemic, and I was scared. I just, I lost my job before the pandemic, and so I was in this weird unemployment limbo, and I was worried that like all of my neighbors were going to get evicted. It was going to be this huge disaster in my in my building with my neighbors. Um, and so we had this like catalyst moment where we were able to organize the building and go on red strike really, really, really quickly. But that wouldn't have been able to happen unless we had like unless like that wouldn't have been able to happen um, if we hadn't already sort of been half organized. Um, we got organized through like pet sittings. Everybody in the building had like a pet, and instead of having to pay a pet sitter, you would just like ask your neighbor like, "Oh, here's the key. Can you go feed uh, you know Pickles his food in the evening when we're going to be gone camping this weekend?" Um, and that made me realize that, like how accessible organizing actually is. Like it's not hard. It's saying hello to people at the mailbox. It's like, say, like being excited to see the people that you see every single day, getting to know them a little bit, asking their name, asking what their birthday is, asking if they have any pets. Like things that are already exciting and fun to you, people are going to want to connect with you over that. And through a whole bunch of us doing those like small interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Like when you do have a moment where you can catalyze, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a global pandemic, but it could be anything. It could be uh, somebody in your workplace getting fired, or it could just be like somebody just like having a really, really bad day and needing community to come and support them. Like you'll be ready, like those community, like those networks are going to be formed. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just like, it's not, it's not as hard as you think it is. And I really want to like say that with like love and encouragement. Like we're all just regular ass people. Um, we, you know, have to like wipe our butts too. So it's it's not that hard. And for those who are uh, huge introverts like I am, uh, it gets easier. <laughs> the more you do it. So get some practice in and uh, it will be a time. Um, and also if I could answer my own question before we jump into Q&A. Um, so today, uh, City Council, I believe, unanimously voted to give Riot Cops raises. So, so they are clearly planning for whatever future uprisings are coming, which 
Uh, hopefully, there will be future uprisings. And so we have to diversify our tactics. You know, we can't just be having like these parades in the streets anymore. We need to divide up because they can't they can't go after us if there's like ten of these groups. You know, we need we need to figure it out because they are planning something. So we also have to find something too. And um, oh, also, um, so over there, I have um, a um, petition or signatures for. Um, uh, participatory budgeting. So, um, you know, obviously the business interests have a lot, of, a lot of say in how our budget is spent. You know, they want it to all go to police, and so a lot of it does. And so we want to at least get like a portion of that to be able to have people decide what we want. So if that's something you're interested in, if you're a registered voter in Portland, please sign legibly <laughs> over there. Um, and so now, um, who's got questions? Do you have a question right there? Go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. I I don't actually have a question. But a quick comment and a quick comment, if that's okay. Um, about in 2018, I went on a trip on the river with the Fresh Water Trust, and I was able to meet one of my elders of the community, of the Native American women's community, and he spoke over me and the group of women that were there that the women are going to restore the land. Um, there's a much longer message that he gave that I would love to share with everyone here in this can't pull up right now, but if we could get together in some way, I would love to share it with you because since 2018, the women that he spoke over it were actually many of the women who are representatives of the companies that you're talking about, and I knew he was not talking about those women. And I was so discouraged and so sad because I know that the mother wants to feed and support and love on her children, but that there's something else happening that is profit-based and not people-based. And humanity only exists when it's people-based. The prophecy that he gave was so deep and so beautiful. And sitting here, I had no idea this was happening. I changed my campaign plans to make it here. I know that what you are doing is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so Please be encouraged. You know that what you are doing is already victorious. It is happening, and it's happening here, and it's happening now. And I'm just really grateful that you guys are here together now. So thank you, sisters. The second thing that I wanted to say was... Oh, wait, real quick. Um, I just wanted to get it on the microphone, because I don't know if people wanted that heard. But um, so um, you were speaking with a Native American elder, and um, he had a prophecy that the women are going to lead the way. And you're noticing a lot of these women in power are like in these organizations and, and on these boards, and it's extremely discouraging. Um, but the fact that we're here and we are organizing and we're fighting is encouraging you. And was there anything else? It's beyond encouraging, it's confirmation. Confirmation of the prophecy. And then the second thing that I wanted to say was if I could, a response to the last question of what to do. Um, I agree with absolutely everyone, but I want us to remember that. The plan that is being rolled out right now, and we can go as far back as like, you know, if you're a person who's religious, like there's this manuscript programming that we're all living out right now. Someone created a back to these groups that came together to create these plans that are happening, they're real estate happening now. Someone thought of this idea and have been working against it. All of us in this room have been playing defense to their offense. Um, my desperate message to the world for many years is to please have a vision for your life, not what you don't want, right? Not a response to what you see and are experiencing. That's defense, right? Catch a vision for what you want, not, oh, I don't want this, I don't want them to win these seats. It's, I want these people in these seats for this reason, because they have this heart, or they have this poor value of working. We have to start casting the vision. And many of us are so beaten down from someone else's vision that we don't know how, that we don't even think we can. The number of women and people of color who literally cannot access their imagination is, is discouraging to me at times, but heal. Self-care, center self-care. Don't center commerce and the circulation of money. Center your genuine care, the care of your community. Heal the trauma. 
the financial confusion, whatever your poverty mentality, whatever you have to do, whatever your unique situation is, feel the thing that is holding you back and keeping you under the thumb of someone else's plan. Because ultimately, your mindset, we behave if we believe. And for too long, we have believed that they are stronger, that they are the power, that what they say goes, and we have to just ask for permission to have something different. Fuck that shit. I want to know if every single person here, whether you're a childcare person, me too, or a community organizer, or an economic developer, or whatever it is, we need to start creating economic plans that center people and not profit, that center the needs of this human basis so we can all ascend together. That is the thing that's missing. In five years ago, my life was centered around making sure my rent could get paid. I get it. When I started centering my life around my self-care and my release of trauma and my reconnection with community, everything came together, including my personal finances. Now, just, I'm at the point that I'm able to support other businesses. What does it look like to completely reframe how you live your life, how we could connect together um, in that regard? To me, we are so traumatized by this narcissistic ass, white supremacist, patriarchal bullshit that we think we have to ask for permission, that we think that we can't cast a vision for our lives because it's not possible. Get over the it's not and we need your wellness to project the next dream. We need it now, right now. Um, so let's see if I can um, summarize this. Um, so, you know, what we're experiencing now is, is a dream 50 years in the making. So, you know, these business interests, interests came together with this dream. And so we've kind of been on the offensive or, or the defensive, right? So um, we've been reacting to someone else's dream rather than really like dreaming up our own dream. And so it's on us uh, to heal and to, uh, to start reimagining what is possible and go on the offensive rather than just continuing to be defensive and, and reacting to someone else's dream. You're so <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, before we take more audience Q&As, we actually, because we have a live stream, we do have um, some online part, um, questions that we just want to answer um, to make sure that there is um, participation for our virtual viewers. So, um, yeah, go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Brenna. Um, I am with both ILPS Portland and Sisters of the Road. Um, here to bring you a question from online. That question, I'm synthesizing two questions that are pretty similar um, into one, which is, can government work on liberation and implementing socialist policies in Portland? I mean, I'll just re repeat what I said at the end. It's not the government that does that. It's us who does that. And I think going off of our sister's past comment, uh, it is the new systems are ones that we will build together. We're taking these campaigns, and oftentimes we start from that uh, mindset of what we're fighting against, because that's the thing that is most present for us. Like we need, we're losing our wages, we're losing our housing, we're losing access to services we need, like preschool for our for our children. Um, but once we can get together, we have to put our differences aside to make sure we can be as united as possible. But the more united we are, the more better place we're in that that new system is. So back to the question, can a government pursue socialist or liberation programs? That's what we do as a people. That's that vision that we can build together if we're ready to fight for it. I mean, yeah, I think it, a socialist future is totally possible. It's definitely not going to happen today um, or tomorrow or even maybe in 10 years. Um, 
And so we have to kind of like do this weird dance with like, we have to use the shitty tools that we have today. That looks like voting, that looks like submitting testimony on like kind of shitty bills that you don't like. Um, kind of like staying in the know about what's going on with like the fascists and like what's happening inside of the PBA. But then it's also taking time out of your life to participate in, in events like this in practicing organizing skills because we are a part of a movement that is going to go on beyond us and like I really have to believe that otherwise it's just way too discouraging um but we are the people who make it better not not nobody else not somebody in a position of power who grants you permission to do that you have to do that yourself and you do that with your comrades the people in this room here and other people that you want to meet and I just to add one final practical part onto that that you can use is in your campaigns, you need a call and you need a demand. A demand is what you're telling the government or the business or whatever your target is, this is what you should do. And we're going to bring the pressure to make sure you do this. We need universal health care. We need eviction representation. But then you have a call. And that call is grassroots people power or build a people's alternative. So your demand is to whatever you're targeting, but your call, that's how you're telling everyone engaged in your campaign what that new world is we're going to build together that goes far beyond this, initial, this individual campaign right now. I just want to say one quick thing, and that is part of this that is also we reimagine the government. I mean, the whole thing is we know we need to act collectively. That collective work that we think it needs to be doing. It's not because it's been defined by working for the Portland Business Alliance and their cronies. That's not necessarily that's the government. It's us. We we own the collective. We need to recreate and replace what's happening now. All right, uh, you in the back. You can be loud as possible. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Jonas. I'm running for Congress in District 3. You may or may not have heard about me. Um, I'm here because I support you all. That's why I'm here. I have some other things to go to tonight, and this will require me. You don't see the other people here that are running for Congress. The reason is because they either don't know about this or they don't care. Um, we're talking about being active, and we have an election coming up. District 3, Earl Blumenhauer is retiring. He's been in Congress since 1996. This seat is now open after 27 years. My three opponent candidates are part of the establishment that you're talking about. They are given the stage at city club, at business events, at educational association events. So what I want to be clear about is there is burning it all down, which I encourage some of you to do is want to believe that. And then there is trying to hire someone like me, who I built my law firm rational uniform from scratch because I said, we need to do community business law. We need to help mutual aid organizations, nonprofits, and small businesses. And the SBA noticed, and last year, the Small Business Administration named me Small Business Champion Year for Oregon. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that we need people in the structure that know the structure and our social justice advocates to change the structure. We don't need surface level people who are tied to the political system because what we're doing is we're cycling. Same thing with city, same thing with Congress. We're getting people who are very surface level. They don't want to have deep conversations. They don't want to talk about race or vote bans. They also believe that they're experts on housing and mental health when they're not. And so my pitch to you is to think about candidates like myself. I know that sounds self-indulgent or narcissistic, but I am giving up my law firm in order to run for Congress because I believe that I am the best fit for this job. But what I want you to do is think about candidates like myself in all of the races, candidates who know the structure and want to get in the structure and they want to take what you're talking about in this room to those people at that table and say, this is not how we're doing it. So I hold that privilege 
as a business attorney with an MBA to get invited to the structure and then to say that's not how we're doing it. The problem that I have right now is that I don't have the same platforms. I don't have a sister in Congress. I'm not coming off of a political role. So I need you all to rally because this primary is in two months. He's a great lawyer, by the way. I've never met him, but I use him. Um, so you know, just in case, I don't know if people, in case uh, people online didn't hear, uh, Michael is running for Congress in District 3, and the other three opponents are um, established opponents. And I'm just saying that we need people on the inside that um, you know have the know-how and have um, the drive to um, change things from the inside. And is there anything else? Or is that I'm good? Sorry. And, and also, if I could comment real quick on that, um, two things. One, uh, so the founder of Unite Oregon, Kitajama, um, he is a um, immigrant from, I believe, um, Somalia, and uh, he actually became a politician because he noticed that we were having trouble getting a lot of things done at United Oregon. And so actually we can go to him now and be like, hey, we need you to push this for us. So uh, I agree it's good to have people on the inside. Also, there is a candidate forum on 420. Um, Sign up for Unite. Uh, it's uh, specifically focused on environment and we're gonna have all of the uh, candidates that are trying to um, get that position in District 3. Um, quite another question. Okay, you're right there. Yeah, she, it's, it came to my attention recently about when we when we petition to get an initiative on the ballot, um, the example was Measure 110. Like, I couldn't think of like a worse way to make a paper look bad than the ballot measure that became 110. And I want to hear just a little bit about how people have like what kind of people did you need to know to write a solid ballot measure? And that's it, yeah. Um, so you're wondering, uh, in terms of uh, Measure 110, um, well, no, these or, you know, yeah. well, you were referencing Measure 110 in terms of talking about um, you know, some of the ballot measures aren't uh, really well written, and so you're wondering how um, to get uh, better written ballot measures? You specifically, when you, when you have like, a ballot measure that we petition in, it's not written by policy experts necessarily, it's written by whoever came it forward. I think that's what you have to do and get the right people in the room and push it. I mean, people right now, you know who's writing them. And we're writing some of them, but not enough. Who do you send it to? Yeah, who do you email to? To get better content? To get a ballot measure, let's submit it. Pick who you control. Is it like, like a, I, I want to hear from someone who's done that from a grassroots level, like what that, yeah. what that process is. It looks like a bunch of research and talking to everybody you respect who you think really knows more than you about it and getting, figuring out like, okay, this is really, really what we're talking about. And then it also, for us, we had volunteer lawyers write it up with the policy, the research team, and then though, it means going to a good electoral attorney who works in, for um, our side and who can put it in the uh, language that's very difficult to challenge and then defend it through those legal challenges, which we did. And I would be happy to tell anybody, they should go to Margaret Olney. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the process right there. Um, yeah, we kind of modeled the same process of developing the ballot um, language for eviction representation for all, that was 26-238. Um, after the, the success of the um, Up Now campaign, and we used the same, um, uh, what, what is she called again? Margaret Olney. Her, yeah, her name is Margaret Olney, and she, what, what's her like? Yeah, she's like an electoral attorney. Yeah, she's an electoral attorney, and so she was um, really successful at being able to like defend um, the ballot language from all the PBA attacks that we got. Um, but as far as like how you 
create the policy like that just comes from research and like it started with a google doc that we were like hey this is kind of what we, what we want and then we fleshed it out and we tried to figure out like what all the mechanisms were and like how um you know like how people would get access to this legal representation like what existing mechanisms are in place where we can have those interventions who would be providing the, the um representation like how would we collect the money all that kind of stuff was um was just it started in a Google Doc, and then um, we shopped it around with volunteer lawyers. Um, there are comrade lawyers out there, and also there are also comrade people in the establishment who can um, work on your side to, to defend these um, these measures. I think also when we're talking about how ballot measures are written, ERA had a lot of critique on how it was written. Up now had critique on how it was written. Measure 110 is getting an inordinate amount of critique on how it's written. The failure of Measure 110 is not because of how it was written, but because of how it was implemented and because of the media narrative around how it's being implemented. So I can have a greater conversation about that. That's not necessarily the nature of the question, but I just want to say that that may not be the best example because it wasn't decriminalization that raised overdose rates. It wasn't decriminalization that kept people out of treatment beds. It is because of our failed system, and that was an attempt to reroute funding to systems that would work for people, and they did start working. It just takes time. So part of it is we need to be patient, right? Portugal said it took four to five years to see a difference in use rates on their streets and in treatment rates. So part of this work is being patient and also, as I said, staying a part of the process as it gets implemented. Anyway, just have to say that. Activated um, to defend uh, your win. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I that's that's a powerful question, and I think one thing is being part of a multi-issue organization because the fact is, you know, a campaign itself is super intensive. It takes a lot of time from a lot of people, and you are not going to maintain that level of engagement because you do not have a job for everybody to do, but there are plenty of other things that need to be done. But you need to be keeping your lists and keeping your media active and so that then when the threat comes, you can get the message out back through the organizations who were engaged and say, right, remember when we did this thing? Well, guess what? They're after it now. I mean, because, you know, there's just such a, a rhythm to a campaign that you're not going to stay at that high level of mobilization, but and people need to take a break, you know, from what they're doing, and they maybe they plug in on some other thing over here, and maybe they go out the Pacific Crest Trail instead for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I will say to kind of add to that, being a part of like a, a multi-issue organization, um, also like. B build in time for breaks and like make sure that like you are very protective of people's capacities and like recruitment so that people can take breaks so that you can have critical redundancy so like things don't collapse if people get sick or you just need to step away um i think yeah like it's it's not just um, maintaining a, a certain level of, of engagement, but it's it's just kind of like thinking about this in terms of like one one long long large like you know struggle. It's not just like a, a single fight. It's lots of fights built over time. And if you find yourself like I can't you know do something for like 
you know, the next five years, then maybe you need to evaluate like what is on your plate and like what you can and what you ought to be um, contributing. And that's when you that's when you decide to recruit more. So you don't have to worry about um, you know having having new energy at the very end of the campaign. I just want to end it out with saying like through these campaign processes you're building relationships. So part of that is, as you're building relationships, how are you going to maintain them? How are you going to stay relevant? How are you gonna help people? Because people wanna stay plugged in. How do you make it easy for people to stay plugged in? Join an email list, like have an email list, have a social media, have a website, like having something that is maintained throughout the entire implementation process is really important. I know it sounds silly and it's admin work, but that stuff, I swear, 90% of organizing is actually admin work, so <laughs> you already used to say, email this as long. All right, we have time for one more quick question. Anybody? Yes. Hi, um, I guess my question is, how do you maintain a positive culture in the group to have, I mean, you, you, you know, the way to this thing, but you know, have people survive the shit storm of both like official reaction but also like bizarrely pointed snippy shit to get on social media. Oh, <laughs> 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 you know, all this is kind of like for uh, you know dealing with other activists who are much more into this than social teams, I would say. But I guess the question is that how do you how do you build a uh, say a pro-social culture seeing as how a lot of activists are kind of so the question is, is how do you build a pro-social culture and uh, during you know ups and downs of campaigns and, and dealing with folks that are you know in the activism for the scene and not necessarily um, for the, the cause? <laughs> I think there are probably a lot of good answers to your question, and I'll just suggest the two that come to me right away. One is, you know, in terms of the stuff that gets thrown at you, you have to have a good time with that. <laughs> you know, you just do. You have to be goofing around with yourself. Just like, ah, eh, we've got this guy again. What do we say? <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to enjoy it. But um, the other thing is, I think, more seriously, is, oh, I forget the name of the young woman who's writing these books, but talking about learning to do good conflict resolution within our own organizations so that we are becoming better human beings with each other. Yeah. We are not Adrian trying, Adrian. yes, I'm talking about Adrian Marie Brown. You know, that kind of stuff. The, we have to pay attention to that, that it's not all about, I'm the rightest right person around here. You know, it's actually, you are my comrade, what I really think about what you're just doing and saying, I'm not going to say that exactly, but we're going to have to work through this because we're not going to just toss each other out. You know, we need to be making progress together. So I was very impressed when I first started reading her to say, okay, now we're talking. Now we're talking. We're not going to just have schisms and kick people out all the time. We've got to figure out how we deal with stuff. Yeah, I feel like we should just go down the line to the office. <laughs> I like that we all have to say. Um, I agree with you. You need to find a way to make things fun. I love that as a part of the ERA campaign, they let me make medals for people when they like won things. I actually just found the chili competition medals. I'm so embarrassed, but I will get them to the winners. Um, but I made the most awesome like pancake medal for the person who made pancakes for the 5K. And really, it's these little things that make, that just ease the burden. And also recognizing that people mess up. I've messed up so much, and part of it is we have to give each other grace. While holding boundaries, this takes a lot of personal development. You need to take things, you can't take things so personally, but you need to grow. You can't be in it for the ego, that does not last, <laughs> trust us. Um, it will be thrown back in your face. So personal development, really, yeah, reflecting on yourself and reflecting on your own values and yeah, making things fun, having a fun day. I think we've had like, we've got, we've had fun events that were like not campaign related, just where we could like get in this positive energy and you need to build in that time. 
Yeah, I would echo that most of organizing is relationship building. I would actually say 90% of it is relationship building. Sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> but, uh, it has to be genuine relationship building um, with other, other people that you can invite into your organization or relationships with other organizations. You know, ILPS, we're an alliance of organizations. And because we're a global alliance, we're able to connect with lots of different organizations around the world, fighting them back in some of these same systems. We're having our seventh, our seventh ever international assembly in Phnom Penh, Malaysia, in just a few months, where all of our members, for again, or over 300 members, will send representatives there. And it's times like that that we're able to make those really close connections and celebrate our victories. Because we have to remember our victories. When we make mistakes, and we will, that's how we all got here, right? We made mistakes and learned from them. Um, the best place to make a mistake is in an organization. Because the world we live in, it's a racist world. It's a patriarchal world. And that this world is just going to teach people to keep making the same racist and patriarchal mistakes over and over and over again. And it's in an organization that you can actually struggle things out. You can work to keep people safe and make sure that you work to change, get yourself in a place to change that world. We change ourselves so that we can change the world. And when we change the world, by waging these campaigns enough so that we create a movement that is ready to, to build power together, then we'll have a society that is actually meant to heal and thrive and not one that's going to throw people out for profit. So relationship build, and know your history. Know the victories that of uh, the people told to do the same thing on. And always learn from your mistakes. Don't make the same ones. <laughs> I think um, having time and like creating opportunities to like have a silly goofy time with the people who you are spending an inordinate amount of time and so much effort is like really 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 essential like you you have to find moments of joy you have to be protective of those times um i think one of my favorite parts of the era campaign was some delightful check-in questions that we would start off every wednesday meeting with like one of my favorites was like would you rather eat an overripe banana or an underripe banana? And it was a it was a very very divisive um, meeting. Like, like it was we were fighting about this, you know, fighting jokingly for like months afterwards. So like there are ways to incorporate joy and community in every aspect of the things that you're doing. Um, you just gotta be creative. Like that's why you know you can attract so many different people with so many different perspectives and have, you know, everyone participate to each of their own ability, right? Like that's that's really kind of like what that speaks to. Um, and then I feel like, I had one other one, but I think I forgot it, but yeah, have a silly goofy time. <laughs> Don't listen to the haters, unless you're trying to learn how to counter their narrative. <laughs> Thank you. We have some, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was great. I love those answers. I love having a silly, goofy time. Um, I live for silly, goofy moments constantly, 24-7. Um, awesome. Well, we have one more section, um, which is going to be our discussion section, where we're y'all are going to pair up or maybe go into groups of three and like discuss some things. So it's going to be really fun. But because we're cutting short to time, I just want to like do my closeout stuff first, just to make sure I don't forget it. Don't mind this crumpled piece of paper. So before you leave, I really want to emphasize, um, there should be like a sign-up sheet somewhere on that org table over there. Um, it's on, is it? I have it, but I'll put it on the table. Okay, it's gonna be on my left, which is your right, on that side of the room. Um, please, if you wanna like stay in touch and learn more about how we can fight the PDA together, please give us your name and email or whatever else you want to give us um, so we can talk to you about it. That would be great. Also, there is a post-event survey. I know I mentioned this before, but I really, really, really want you to take it. And it would make me really happy personally if you did. Um, and I think you want me to be happy. Um, so please take it. Um, there are QR codes all over the, like there's one over there. There's probably some elsewhere. There's one in the bathroom. Um, don't take it in the bathroom though. Um, yeah, please do that. 
And um, yeah, if you have garbage, throw away your garbage. That would be very much appreciated. And um, yeah, and thank you, um, X-Ray FM and the numbers again for live streaming. That's amazing. <laughs> There's uh, you know a place to put stickies if you like uh, comments, questions, recommendations, anything you know we want to hear from you. So feel free to add that. Also, sign if you're registered to vote in Portland. Statutory budgeting um, uh, petition over there, and um, and also so the the, the participatory part right now is kind of like. I don't know, I was raised evangelical and not anymore, but you know how, like, turn to your neighbor and whatever, you know, that's, that's what we're kind of talking about. <laughs> yeah, and I, please turn to someone that you don't know so you can make friends. Um, but what we want you to discuss is, one, like, what was something that you learned here today? But we want to know, um, what did you hear tonight that impacts you the most? And based on the campaigns you've heard about, what do you think needs to be done to successfully fight back against the PDA? Um, we can give you like maybe about five minutes or so, three minutes, three minutes <laughs> to discuss. Um, but we want to give the opportunity for folks to share. Um, so we can we maybe have enough time for like one or two people, um, as long as you keep it under like three minutes. But yeah, go go talk to each other. Yeah, I don't know. 